Heidi ho everybody this is classic role player and drive through rpg is having a big halloween sale for another 12 days uh it's october 19th 2023 they're having a happy halloween sale so everything, a lot of things are on sale out of that um i discovered a new game i hadn't noticed before it's been around a few years from gallant night games i love gallant night games uh they're the makers of tiny dungeon which i own tiny d6 uh, this is tiny dungeon i've got this this is a really sweet little nice system by alan bear bar i think it's bear i don't know i don't know what it is but i digress gallant night games creators of tiny dungeon tiny cthulhu which i also own which is really cool and now uh well they probably had it out for a while but uh eo rathril I'm, i know i got that wrong eo rathril <laughs> it's a very very uh og uh osr type of rpg that i've never discovered and it's on sale for four dollars and 19 cents from seven dollars so yeah if you're a collector of osr rpgs like i am i just want to have everything that i can get my hands on or if you're kind of new to the osr scene the uh the, the original renaissance uh D, D in the old days type of scene you want to get away from some of the newer stuff uh, this would be a great place for you to start i'm gonna crack this PDF open, show you some of the cool mechanics that he includes in here, and uh, you can make your decision for yourself. If it's something you're looking for, and you're looking for an OSR to collect, or you're looking just to get into a new game, it's $4.19. I mean, come on. So let's open this book up. EO Rathril. I just gotta apologize if I just completely destroyed that name, but that's what it looks like, EO Rathril. So, whatever. I like what this says. It's an old quote role-playing game in other words it's got the old school renaissance feel leveraging the classic old school d20 mechanics forged into a new game that represents the storytelling style and martial role-playing of yesteryear in the introduction alan says that yeah uh, this this game was a weird one to write at its core, it's just a compilation of his favorite uh, D20 OSR rule sets slapped into a nice package. He loves martial stories. He loves combat, blood, sweat and tears, uh, lots of destruction, splintered spears. He says that the heroes um, are just as likely to die on a bridge. Where does he say that at? Heroes can overcome odds. Yeah, they're more likely to die on a bridge defending a small town from brigands than they are in conflict with goblins and dragons. In other words, it's gritty and it's very, very martial. While great evil exists and looms, the little acts are what binds and holds Eo Rathil together, keeping the world intact. I like it. I like it. I like the feel. It's clean. It's crisp. It's consinct. Consinct? All right. So right off the bat, first thing he does is get into the lore of Eo Rathil. And I'm not, what we're going to do here is I'm just going to try to highlight some of the things I like best about this system. I went through the book quite a, pretty quickly. And um, man, he's got some pretty cool things he adds and, and things he takes away and i like that um, but we're not going to go over all of it because i want you to buy the pdf yourself if you like it we'll see if you like it i'm going to give you a taste and if you like it go get it he goes on to say this has been his default home campaign for years and, and while it's fleshed out uh to fill out the book would diminish the overall elements of the rule set so yeah it sounds like he could probably just add a whole book of lore later on All right, getting started. Rule number one, like you hear so often, uh, it's the narrator who has the right to modify the rules. In fact, it's encouraged. There are gaps in the rules, holes left on purpose, because much of the fun of the old school gaming is being able to make up rules as needed. House rules are the best rules, in my opinion. Again, he wants to make sure everyone knows this is literally a compilation of others' work that I've tweaked and added to, so make it your own. Then I found this interesting. He adds a very modern mechanic, a good mechanic from 5e, the advantage and disadvantage. If you're rolling with advantage, you're rolling 2d20s. If you're rolling with disadvantage, you roll 2d20s, and you keep the least beneficial. Advantage, I forgot to say, roll 2d20s, and you get the best out of the two. So you get to roll uh, twice and take the best, or twice and take the worst, depending on what kind of situation. And like he says, and I agree with him, advantage disadvantage is one of my favorite new mechanics to hit the D20 sphere. It removes the need for small bonuses, modifiers so nicely. I can't help but include it all the time. I agree. All right, his character sheet, very nice. Let me let me flip over to the character sheet really quick, just so you know. I love it. It's crisp. It's clean. It's concise. Don't know why I keep saying that, but it is. You know, you got your you got your attributes. You got your stuff you need. 
and not a lot of bogus stuff. Saving throw, we'll get into that in a minute. Here's your modifiers, spells, boom, boom, boom. That's all you need. Let's play the game. All right, so the way he decides to do attribute scores is interesting. Of course, he says do them however you want them, but the way he does them is pretty cool. So you pick the kind of character you want to play because I don't like the idea of forcing people the, the, the very old school, natural, very original way. Not everything that was done in the original books were best because it made for some miserable role playing, I assume. If you want to, if you came to the table wanting to be a fighter and you rolled a three for your strength, life's going to suck for you. So like he says, think what kind of character you want to play, identify which skills are important for your concept, whether it's a, a fighter and I'll, I'll go, I'll get into the classes here in a minute. Then put an 11 in the three most important attributes for the, the kind of person you want to be. Put a 10 in the remaining three. And then roll five six-sided dice. Lay them out from left to right. Put the highest on your left. That's dice one. And the rightmost dice is dice five. And this is interesting, guys. It, it, it's not as simple as you think it is. And it really it, it, uh, rewards you, rewards your highest attribute when you use it. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to also give you a penalty system. So you take your five dice. You lay them out. Your best die you put on your first one. Die number one. So let's say that's a six. Uh, now you'd have a 17 in this attribute. But then on the attribute two, let's say it's um, dexterity. It's an 11 because it's attribute two. I gotta, I gotta subtract a six. So now I'm down to what, five? Uh, but then die two is maybe a five. So I'm up to 10. So that kind of sucked. Um, here's an 11 uh, and then I subtract five. So now I'm at six and let's say this is a four. So now I'm at 10 and so on and so on. And as you can see, like he says, Dice five is super important because if this is your, the trip you care least about and you're subtracting D5 and you're not giving yourself a plus, it's going to be brutal. This one will give you one very good stat, one weak stat, and about four that range between great and good. I like it. That's very cool. I've never seen this employed before. And he says, I use this form of character creation to generate stable, interesting, but very varied characters. It keeps everyone on the same page and power level while allowing everyone to feel different and unique. Great idea, Alan. Then, of course, he goes on to say, do it the way your narrator wants to do it. People roll 3D6s, make a pool. There's all kinds of ways of doing it. And some people are super hardcore and say, you roll 3D6 for strength. Whatever you get, that's your strength. That's brutal. All right, here's our universal attribute bonus tables. As you can imagine, 3D6 is a minus one, seven to 14 is nothing, and 15 to 18 is a plus one or plus 5%. You might notice here, there's no plus one, plus two, plus three, like everybody else. So it keeps it a little bit more simple. All right, he goes on to describe attributes in his way. This I found interesting for experience points when you get rewarded experience points. If your prime attribute of your class is a 15 plus, you get 5%. If wisdom is 15 plus, you get 5%. And if charisma is 15 plus, you get 5%. So you can have a maximum of 15% uh, experience bonus based upon uh, your character if you got some really good rolls. I think it's going to be kind of hard to do all three of those with his system, but, but still very cool and I like the idea. So this is unique hit points, uh, represent the amount of damage you can take. We all know about hit points, yeah. But the way he does it is it's constitution plus your level. So whatever your constitution score is, and you add your level. And so for, for example, a first level character with a 13 constitution would have a 14 hit point. A second level with a 13 constitution would have a 15. You might be able to raise your constitution. But um, as you can see, this is very low level hit point uh, progression. All right, he's got vocations, which aren't classes, but uh, you can add a vocation, such as if you want to be a warrior, you could be a bodyguard, a city watch, a mercenary. If you want to be a thief, you can be an assassin, a pirate, a spy. And he doesn't actually define the list of vocations. You make up the vocation. If, it's, if, it, if your narrator is okay with it, um, that's great. And then if you find an action check that uh, is asked for that might relate to your vocation, um, such as being a bodyguard, if you want to intimidate, or if you want to protect somebody, you're going to get a plus one to that check. I like it. Starting currency is your average fare of 3d6 times 10. But this is interesting. Alignment. They don't have alignment. There's law and there's chaos. And that matters to clerics who dwell on such lofty matters. But for the rest of the world, it's often irrelevant. Gray areas are interesting. Absolutes are not. Very cool. All right. The available character classes. Barbarian, knight, fighter, ranger, sage, swordmaster, thief. Alan doesn't like magic using classes uh, so he threw in the sage but as he says over here in the designer note they're easy enough to port do what you want sounds cool this i like if you choose a, a homeland for your character and you have a certain class certain favored class you can get attribute bonuses if you roll 
a certain roll on the die. So let's say I'm a thief and I come from Hestian and I roll a f uh, five. Now I can get a plus one to wisdom. You might notice fighters aren't there. There is no favorite class for fighters. Fighters happen everywhere. We're gonna go into a couple of the classes in detail. I'm just gonna show it to you. I'm not gonna show you all of them again. I want you to grab the PDF for yourself if you like this system. So the Barbarian, as you can see, Constitution plus 10. So if, I, if he starts with a 15, the highest this Barbarian will ever get is a 25. Here's our experience points. Seems like a lot of experience points to get uh, higher levels. I like it. That's the way it used to be. Here's your hit bonus when you're rolling. Note that saving throw is a single number and it goes down for you to save. Barbarians have savage blows. They can run fast. Survive the wilderness. All the normal things. On saving throws, barbarians receive advantage on all saving throws to resist spells and magic effects. Uh, the fighter, the fighter's cool. The one thing that fighters have is they have extra attacks per round, which is pretty cool. Here on the fighter, he actually gives you kind of a specialty. If you want to be a marksman, you can specialize in ranged attacks and you gain advantage on ranged, ranged attacks. Or you could be a sword and board. Or you can be a Landish Knechte fighter. That's how you pronounce it. I had to check. Landsknecht. Although that video has like a 30% down vote, so I'm not German. I don't know if that's actually the way you say it. Who cares? Uh, so you could be a two-handed fighter, sword and board fighter, or a marksman. You can specialize. This is something cool with a couple of different uh, classes. Not all the classes get something like this, but uh, for the fighter at ninth level, they can establish a stronghold. They become a baron or baroness. They get a body of men at arms who, who, were, who will swear fealty as loyal followers. Very cool. I really dig the old school but very nice uh, art in this book as well. I love knights. Absolutely love them, says Alan. Here's our ranger. Let me go over. There's our sage. This is hardcore. It looks like the sage can't cast spells in the system until level four. I could be wrong. I read it. Um, but it looks like, I mean, maybe they can read scrolls. Maybe they can do certain things. I might have missed that. But it looks like they can only prepare spells or memorize spells uh, starting at level four. Guy really does hate magic. Wanted to show you the thief. So the thief has most of your thieving stuff um, like everything else. They got disguises. Very cool. Lots of really cool rules in here. Poison. Uh, they become an expert thief at level five. But then at level nine, this is another cool. This could be a lot of fun role-playing wise for you and your group they can establish a thieves guild at level nine uh, he is known as a guild master and those who arrive are members of his thieves guild i think it'd be really cool to have a party where someone someone now has a stronghold in the party someone has a thieves guild maybe the thieves guild is stealing from the stronghold <laughs> lots of opportunity for role-playing there here's your basic list of equipment we're not going to worry about that it's all as normal as you would suspect he gives you the easy packs, thank goodness. He's got mounts. If you want to get super crunchy, you can get into tack and harness. Too crunchy for me. Goes over some of the weapon properties. They've got certain weapons have certain properties I like. Light, you can... Uh, the light weapon, you can use strength or dexterity, depending on which is your better attribute. Versatile, you can use in either hand. Very cool. Love it. Armor class is super simple. It's 10 plus whatever armor you're using. He has an armor table up here. Uh, that is your armor class. You got hiring assistants. As in old school D&D, you pretty much had in those days to hire hirelings um, or assistants as he calls them. And because you were probably going to die. You have very few hit points uh, like everybody does. And things are dangerous. And so based upon your charisma, uh, it depended on how many hirelings you could take with you retainers it, they may have been called in, in old systems i don't know i thought it was hirelings doesn't matter here they're assistants you can get a soldier you can get a sailor uh for these for these prices and this is a price uh for about a week it's basically for an adventure you say hey mr soldier come on my adventure uh we're gonna go kill a wizard in a tower he says okay about a week he's like yep about a week all right, now we're playing the game. So action checks, you wouldn't, you would, I would assume they were D20s, they're D6s. Um, of course, the creator of Tiny D6, it makes sense. But uh, so you'd have an action check of a four or a four plus, and if you get it with your bonus rolls, you succeed on whatever the, whatever the action check is. 
Very cool, very simple, crisp and clean. I need to stop saying that. You got your contest where two people are going at it with D6s. It's a D6 battle. You got your cooperation where people can help with an action check, depending on what it is. They can get a plus three at the most for that. He does initiative by group. Uh, I think Professor Dungeon Master does the same thing. Maybe not, but I still think it's pretty cool. Basically, both groups roll. The narrator would roll for the baddies. The Someone on the team would roll for the goodies. And whoever wins, they get to go first. If it's a tie, then it happens simultaneously. So they're assuming that the whole group beats the other group. Or they tie. If they tie, as he explains here, both of them get to go. You have to roll it out. So basically, you could have a character and a monster killing each other, which I think is cool. You do roll d20s to try to hit. Armor classes, you die at zero hit points. Shocker. There's critical hits. There's critical uh, failures. There's also things he calls exploits, which he doesn't have a list of, but you make up. So if you get a d20, you can ask for an ex exploit. Maybe uh, maybe you uh, disarm a foe, shatter a shield, break a wand, something like that. This is pretty cool. So he's got special attacks, two types of unorthodox melee stances, reckless and cautious. Basically, you either roll with advantage or disadvantage or... Let me explain. You roll with advantage for attacks if you're in reckless attacks, but your enemies also get advantage on their attacks. Whereas a cautious attack, you roll for disadvantage on attacks, and they would also get disadvantage. You got loyalties on your NPCs. Depending on how you treat them, maybe you have long-standing NPCs. That might be something you want to implement into a game. I've had this NPC for, on every adventure for for the last four adventures. Their loyalty is you know, higher than even this, this table would show love it so who knew that you could save against bad things with just one number that's never been a thing to me i guess it is here and i kind of dig it you have one saving throw that covers all kinds of stuff uh an ability a trap some kind of hazard requires you to make a saving throw and uh yeah there you go love it cool idea all right there's a spell list spells and magic i'm going to skip over this chapter six teaches narrators how to run a game although the way the rules were set up i'm i could totally get it i'm ready to go give me i could make up an adventure and i could run this thing in the next 10 minutes if people will show up come on over let's do this chapter seven is about treasure i'll let you read about treasure and experience points lots of items in the treasure section very cool we got some cool magic item descriptions love the bracers of defense Carpet of flying, yes. The deck of many things, yes, sir. Got me a jug of alchemy. Not just a bottle of alchemy. I got me a jug of alchemy. A list of cursed items. Man, I love when my players pick up cursed items. It's the best thing ever. So he's got this concept of myth points that go with magical items based up and, and they things happen with the myth points as the characters use the magical items. It's very, very interesting. As he says here. Myth points are my preferred way to give magical weapons to player characters. There's a certain attachment that growing your own legend and your own weapon seems to give that I really like. The trading out of magical weapons for the next level up always bug me. So you have a magic weapon, man, that you've been using forever. That thing is attuned to you. Maybe the myth points are high. And uh, yeah, you don't want to just trade it out for the next sword plus two. When a weapon first becomes an artifact, the wielder must name it. Pretty awesome. And then you get myth bonus points. You actually get bonuses based upon your myth points. Very cool. Chapter 8, your bestiary. So you got your player's guide. You got your GM's guide. Now we got our, our monster manual all in one. And basically he has uh, hit dice, kind of the level, kind of the experience points. It's pretty easy to read this and just understand uh, what you got here. Very easy reading. Very easy to understand. You got, the, you got your classic uh monsters black puddings blink dogs bugbears centaurs there's demons there's dragons look at dragons hit dice man the dragons have age so even a young dragon is a hit dice of nine uh very tough they got breath weapons a lot of detail here that is a cool looking dragon my friends now you might have noticed that there was no races in the book as far as playable races i don't know if he's assuming everybody's a human probably doesn't matter um he doesn't have any rules that i found Maybe I skipped over it somehow where a race will, will do something different um, as far as uh, abilities. So maybe you just decide you want to play an elf, but it's just the same as anything else. I don't know. Up to you. This game is cool. It, just like most OSRs, it's all about what you want, what you want to do, what your narrator or your dungeon master wants to do. 
And uh, that is pretty much it. Let me see. I think there's one more thing. Oh, yeah, he's got unique items uh, of lore that you're going to want to read, going to want to check out. I think it's pretty cool. And, yes, that is it. There's our character sheet. There's our OGL. Guys, this has been EO. <laughs> Let me try it one more time. EO Rothrill. And I really dig it. You can get it right now for $4.19 on uh, Drive Through RPG. I'll put the links uh, down below. I'll put the links to the Halloween sale and also to e Rothrail. If you decide you want to buy something, if you use my link, it'll help me out. I would appreciate it. That's the system. Hope you liked it. Hope you liked the review. And I appreciate you guys. I'll see you soon. Peace.